you know, I said, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And it seems okay. this is now the thing, you know, to get on Zoom. So I, I heard a rumor saying that Zoom is behind this whole coronavirus thing just because all the st stocks went way up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, cool. yeah, it's cool. I'm I, enjoying it. I I've used it a few times to talk to, I, I've talked to some friends uh, with Zoom and some people have said, oh, let's collaborate or do stuff. So this is my first, uh, like, if you say you're recording this or you're going to broadcast it, this is my first of the, of the quarantine era. Cool. Well, I'm sure there'll be a lot more. Um, what, what kind of collaborations? Like art collaborations? Or um, yeah, the, a friend of mine uh, is a teacher, a public school teacher, and is doing some classes and wanted to bring me on as an art judge. Uh -huh. um, I had appeared on a TV show as a, a judge of an art competition. That still airs. That's still on the air, by the way. Well, the, the episodes are still on Netflix. Yeah, we did a pilot in eight episodes. So there's nine episodes on Netflix. The name of the show is Skin Wars Fresh Paint. And so my friend thought it would be good. You look what? really good on that show. I love the blue hair. Oh, yeah. They, 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 ma they managed my look. The one thing I, I put my foot down, I'll tell you this. They wanted me to wear a fedora, and I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They had real pictures. And they had this other guy, one of the artists on the show had bright red hair, and I was kind of known for bright red hair at the time. Right. So they made mine bright blue. Um, it worked. But, uh, it looked yeah, good. Was, yeah, so, so that was fun. That was in, we filmed that in 2015, oh, wow. and it was broadcast in 2016 on the Game Show Network. And then it's been on Netflix for about a year or so. Yeah. So one day I got a bunch of friend requests. I was like, what? And they were nobody I knew. And they were all just people from all over the world who had seen like the show premiered on Netflix. And it's their skin wars. And we were the sequel show to Skin Wars. We we're called Skin Wars Fresh Paint. So, so I'm going to be doing a Zoom. And I, I don't know what. We're going to have some kids draw stuff or whatever. And I'm going to be like, oh, this guy has been on TV as a judge. So there's a legitimacy there. Hey, right. you're credentialed um, now. Okay. Mm -hmm. It, you're credentialed now. You're on TV. Well, I'm IMDb, yes. <laughs> so, all right, but you've been in the art, art world for how many years now? You've been... Oh, God. 30-some? I don't even know. And, and what about art boot camp? Oh, I did boot camp. Boot camp's fun. Um, I started boot camp in 2006. I did... It's called Art World Boot Camp. And Art World Boot Camp is basically... Um, success strategies for artists. A lot of them are common sense. A lot of them are stuff that you might pick up if you were in almost any field. Right. But a lot of them are really uh, uh, germane to the uh, to the actual, you know, LA and New York at least art world. And um, the thing about it is, and I really try to do this is, I'll do it. I'll do an art. I'll do a boot camp. Do two or three boot camps over the course of say five years, and then I, I won't do. I haven't done a boot camp now in at least two three years. Really? And I won't, and especially now with the coronavirus, I, Sophia, I got to tell you, everything could change. You could know everything about the art world today. And in two years from now, none of that knowledge will apply. Hmm. Um, like, for example, here's something from, from boot camp. And I think this is more an evergreen. This, this applies. And it applies to a lot of creative fields. Um, there are people who will tell you how to make it. I'm sure, you know, in, in the many fields you've worked in, People have told you how to, hey, here's how you, here's what you got to do to make it. Yeah, never. And if, you, if you listen, sometimes their advice is very good. Right. I will not dispute their advice a lot of times, but a lot of times their advice is really from a particular time when they were learning right. or when maybe even they made it to some small degree. Mm -hmm. And so, so you will, you will get people telling you advice that's really good if it's 2003. Right. But it's not. When I, when I first did boot camp in 2006, I, I really said, look, the one important thing you got to do is get a MySpace page. <laughs> Terrible <laughs> advice now, right? You know, so one of the things I try to do at boot camp is when you take it, I try to give you tools that you would use as an artist regardless of um, the, the vagaries of fashion and taste. So I don't sit there and say, oh, here's how you do Instagram. Because right. it's going to change. Instagram's going to change in a year. You know, it's going to be different. Okay, so it's so crazy. Art. You were part of the art world before the whole internet phenomenon. Totally, yeah. And now art has changed because of the internet, which all of a sudden became global. 
And yeah. now there are these rumors cir circulating that we're going to have like three days of darkness. Have you heard this rumor or seen anything about that? Where the internet and phones go down for like three days. Uh. You know, so I'm thinking, so it got me thinking, how will artists be affected without the internet, having known it for so long? Um, well, I mean, you know, I think the advantage uh, for those of us who are, you know, if you're old enough, it's going to be like, oh, this is how it used to be, right? Read a book. <laughs> What's a book? You know, but, um, but yeah, I, yeah, good. Make it five days of darkness. Why not? Why not? I mean, do you think artists can handle it? I mean, because, you know, a lot of times. Look, I, you, here's what you're going to find in, with artists. It's the same as everybody else. There's nothing radically special about artists where they aren't they're more affected or less affected by things you know you're going to find a certain percentage of them really get into it and a certain percentage of them are anxiety ridden and need to smoke a lot of pot and <laughs> it's going to be just like the everybody else i don't i don't know that there's any um i don't see a fundamental difference in uh the temperament of artists hmm. i've met so many artists over the years and you know you can't i mean it's a wide variety of people right and you, know. you know like all levels of it too I mean, yeah yeah exactly i mean successful people i mean you got artists that are very successful that don't even care about their success or manage their success well and then you have ones that are uh you know have employees right and um so so yeah but uh, yeah you know it's, it's like anybody else how did you get into the art world you know You've been there for so long. I, I just never, I never uh, knew what was that hmm. thing that like sucked you in. Well, I was a bad artist. So, I mean, I was a painter. I sucked. <laughs> I, I didn't have the, I just didn't have the um, discipline. Yeah. I see a lot of really unskilled art now. It's like, oh yeah, I used to paint like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I mean, I discovered art. Um, in my late teens, yeah, in my late teens, and I, I really, oh, I'm going to be an artist. And um, I had to get real, though, when I really saw what was out there competition-wise. You know, if I had had any sense or any, um, I don't know, sometimes I wish, like, oh, why didn't I just become a conceptual artist? Hey. Yeah. But when I wrote, I was really happy with the results. I, I was never happy with the results I got as an artist. So when I wrote, it was like, oh, I can write, I can finish it. And I'm happy with it. And then it got a reaction. And other people are happy with it. So, or maybe they weren't happy. Maybe they're pissed off, but it got a reaction. So, You're so. You're a great writer. You are yeah. a great writer. Now, I, I still have your book, Most Art Sucks. Well, love that. But, okay. live by. And Coagula Curatorial, well, you have your gallery, which is on hi hiatus, I suppose, because of this. Yeah, well, I mean, I had a gallery from, well, I've had galleries in the past, and I've curated. So I've curated for 20 years. I've written about art, publishing-wise, almost 30. And what about um, magazine? But, what? A new magazine? Yeah, Coagula Art Journal. And then I've written for all sorts of little things here and there, and big things, too. And, right. and you're some it. things, like the second time they did Lollapalooza, they had an art tent, and they had an art magazine, and I, and I wrote for it. I never went to Lollapalooza. I don't think you could pay me to go to Lollapalooza. But the point is, like, you know, there's, like, all these little things. I don't have, like, a resume. I just tell people, Google me. If you want to work with me, I'm there. But I couldn't fill out an application to get a grant because mm -hmm. I couldn't, um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I could never um, tell you all the crap I've done, all the little things. Like, that's just one thing, you know. And then there was this magazine, Modern Painters, and – it turns out that the magazine I had, Coagula, David Bowie was a subscriber. And when we came out with a book, Most Art Sucks, David Bowie wrote a book review that he was a big fan. It's like, fuck, I didn't know this. I had a subscriber named David Jones. You know, that's his real name. Oh, I did not know. So anyway, and then, he, then, so then one day the people from Modern Painters called me and said, oh, David, which he owned, and said, no, David said, we, we want you to write, he wants you to write about the LA scene. So, oh, okay, so then. I wrote for the modern painters a couple times and then they had a big advertisement for a show by this British artist, RB Katai. And I trashed a show by RB Katai. So I fucked over their advertiser. And then I guess, yeah, <laughs> then I didn't write for him anymore. But, um, 
and they, they paid well. Thanks, David. So, um, but yeah, so that's, that's the thing, though. I can't, I can't tell you. Your light just went off. I did. What was I, that? Did it disappear? <laughs> no, you didn't disappear. You just, it, the, the, you, it all got a little, the, the coloration changed. Ah, uh, my light died. Your light died. See, I have a light back there, but it, it looks terrible if I turn it on. So I, I put this other lamp over there. I don't usually have it on because I can't. But it's my diamond. Well, well so. I'm yellow now. Okay. I'll be yellow. <laughs> okay. Something else to fix. Okay. I'm so happy that was working for a little while, but that's all right. It's so, but yeah, I just, I, I, I'm not the kind of person who has like a resume or any of that shit. It's oh. like, oh yeah. Like on IMDb, people have added movies that I've been in. So you can go in and I was like, oh yeah, I remember doing that movie. Um, I always play myself. I, I'm not an actor. I'm saying like, I'm, you know, you watch a movie about an artist. Right. And then, then I walk in and say, yeah, he's a good artist. So that's basically my, you know, but then it's like, oh, IMDb. It's like, oh, okay. I did that. I, I wouldn't remember, you know, I went to some high school reunion and they had this thing of, oh, uh, people are, I'm a published author and the people I have all these, and I'm like, oh, geez, I didn't, I don't even, I don't even think to do any of that shit. So I don't know. One of the things I love about you, you're just so you know down to earth and real, and you like tell it like. Well, it's, all, it's also I'm a little you know, undisciplined. Attention. Sometimes I wish I like. Um, I've had people work for me over the years. I found it's really helpful if you get somebody to help you if you're doing something, and, and, and labor is an amazing thing. You get somebody else involved. Right. So I've I've worked with people who've been like my assistant, and then you can really get a lot done. Yeah. You know what I mean? I always advise, like, the minute you can spend a dime, get somebody to help you out, you know? Yeah. People think that a computer can help you out sometimes, or, you know, a real organized phone, and I, having somebody else there just with the other perspective really helps. Right, all the grunt work. <laughs> all right. Okay, so what are you doing now on this whole, okay, all right. <laughs> Pellegrino. <laughs> Woohoo! The hard <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, I'm doing what? What are you doing now, you know, on this, you know, lockdown period? Oh, right? I'm kind of, a, you know what, I'm, 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 like, I tried to go today without reading the news, and I, I went, I went more hours without, just didn't read the news at all, that was nice. Yeah. I'm um, trying to write a little more, but, um, uh -huh. yeah, I'm, you know. Are you going to get into, uh, this book? you know. You like to write another book, or? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've written, I'm trying to write some fiction right now, just, for something different. And I mean, like, look, I can't go to art shows, right? There's no art shows to go to. So it's like writing an art essay right now. I don't know what I would write if you, if, but you know, if somebody called me tomorrow and said, Hey, can you write about this? Yeah, I'd write about it. But you know, writing's changed uh, as far as like writing for an audience has changed. I mean, I used to, you know, write, you, you know, you're like modern painters. I wrote three or four times for them. And then there's a couple other things that nobody, you know, there just aren't these venues that pay and, and you know you write something and then you get feedback. That doesn't happen any as much anymore. So I mean, I can just write on Facebook and get feedback. So I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little spoiled. We all are spoiled in a lot of ways. But you know, you have a lot of followers on Facebook too. I mean, so when when you post something, you have a lot of engagement. No, no, that's that, uh, yeah, and and you have to you know anybody who just goes oh what you know you, you got to work at it you know you can and, and there's times it's like. Eh, I'm not going to, I don't, you know, yeah. feel the need to um, engage on every subject, you know. So, okay, so we're on lockdown. They say it for another month. So once this is over, hopefully soon, how do you see the art world being changed because of this? Well, uh, you know, we just went through a very good time in the art world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you look at the Dow Jones, that's where the art world is. So in an abstract but very connected way. Okay. So first things first, you had a lot of people throwing around money on projects, on, on productions, on pop-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of galleries were able to do bigger and better shows. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, okay, let's, I mean, there's like best case scenario would be uh, they come up with a vaccine next month. We all get vaccinated and bam, oh, the world is as it was. And the stock market within a six months is back to the near 30,000 that it was at. Uh, then, then the art world will recover quite, you know, it'll be, you know, like 9-11. Like everything stopped and then it all started again. 
But if we're still quarantined into June, oh, and there's let's say some civil unrest, some cities have had some you know things burned down, uh, uh and nobody can fly anywhere. So then right away you got to think like, okay, the big thing the in, in the last twenty years has been art fairs. Right. That's the fundamental change of the art world then and the art world now. Right. Um, and so art fairs. First off, a big crowd of people. Yeah. Uh, you want to be in a big crowd of people? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a vaccine. It's going to be flu season, coronavirus season again. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, then what else do you have to have? Well, the only reason you want to go to the art fair, the only reason that you want to pay to be in the art fair if you're a gallery is because the collectors are coming. Are the collectors coming? Right. And then who's buying? Is there, are the, the people with money, look at the stock market, do they really have the money? The, the fun money, I mean, there's, there's, you know, people have their, their base wealth. Right. But when they're buying art, I mean, there's a certain, it's the fun money. You yeah. Know? I was like, hey, I'm an art collector. All of a sudden, the stock market's one third less than it was. Do they spend that fun money as much as they were? Right. You know, so, I mean, like I've got people who buy art from me and, and I've only been selling um, secondary stuff, a name artist that somebody owns, somebody owns a Warhol and, and then I find a buyer for the Warhol, you know, I've been doing stuff like that. Yeah. Everybody in the art, I mean, a lot of people in the art world do that. Some right. are more public than others. So. Right. Well, I heard that Art Basel maybe canceled it's not official yet yet just like the con film festival you know which happens in may is gonna more than likely be canceled and those are like millions of dollars well art basil's uh it's rescheduled for september oh so they are rescheduled okay but will okay will, example, it will there be air travel i mean put yourself in a government's position um art basil's in switzerland will switzerland be allowing flights in from china well do you want to go to an art fair where there's, do, do you as a gallery want to invest $50,000 if there's no Chinese collectors coming? Okay. So the, and now this is um, like a medium term. Like let's say we're quarantined till June and shit's taking a little, it's taking a little longer for shit to get back together. Okay. Um, you know, and then there's the worst is that, you know, China was lying about the numbers and more people are going to die than you can imagine. And the hospitals are going to, I'll go bankrupt and yeah, there ain't gonna be an art world. You know, art world's about fun. Okay. Yeah. So We're having fun. <laughs> so would you say that a lot of the art now is gonna be like really dark because there isn't that fun going on? No, because art is Well, no, I mean, I mean, uh, the commercial side of things don't really affect a, a lot of the best, it, it, it doesn't affect at all the best studio work. I mean, you're going to have a lot of stuff on the periphery of people making like, oh, art about the coronavirus thing, and most of it won't be sophisticated enough for art history to care. But you're still going to have, I mean, great artists are going to make art, and it's going to reflect that thing. But I think, like, you don't even see that in the art till 10 years later. Right, or longer. Yeah. Well, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? Just, like, all of a sudden, a whole year of art stuff. Is it on? Oh, oh, well, let's hope it's only a year. Put it that way. Let's let's let, let's put a good spin on it. What if it's more than a year? Okay. I mean, uh, and, and frankly, I don't see the buying level where we were at sales-wise uh, for galleries for artists. I don't see that coming back. Even even if we had the, a quick bounce back, I don't think we're going to get. I think people are just going to be. There's a little trepidation, and if the economy's sluggish, I mean, it's just to get back to where we were uh, could could be any number of years, but we were, look, we were at a high point. I mean, there's always been an art world. I mean, there was an art world in 2009 when the real estate thing collapsed. Um, I was looking at an old issue of my magazine Coagula in, in like, in 1992, there was a recession. We had the LA riots. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we had a headline that said desperation row. And it was about Soho, which there's not even really a art scene in Soho anymore because it all moved to Chelsea in New York. But, so this is a cyclical thing. If it hadn't been the coronavirus, it might have been, Something. you know, bond, the bond market. I don't know anything about the bond market. Then one day the bond market affected everybody's life. I don't know. So, so you know. are you going to keep your gallery for now? <laughs> what happened? You know, here's the thing. I closed the gallery at the, um, 
at the end of September 2019. And um, now the timing is, looks amazing. Oh, genius. But, uh, but um, I, I had a realtor looking around and the, 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 the prices of real estate for, you know, to get a lease were just absurd. Hey, here's a good thing. Coronavirus, eh, the recession, all those real estate prices go down. Yeah. So that's, so maybe that's a good thing. So yeah, so, um, I mean, I love curating and, and I'm in the art market. So, um, but if I, you know, if I never curated another show and I was contributing because I was writing, uh, that's, that's cool too. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm a moody guy. If I'm in the mood, I'm going to do it. If I'm not in the mood, I'm, I'm the worst person to be doing something I'm not in the mood for. I'm, I can't, I don't have that, uh, you know, Oh, this is going to be great. You know? Yeah. And I hate writing about it. If I can't write about it, I can't write about it. I mean, I just, I give an artist their money back and said, look, I tried to write about it. I can't. You know? Has that happened? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really? And then sometimes I've written about them and they're like, God, uh, I really like your writing, Matt. This wasn't as good. And I just said, yeah, I didn't have it. I'm not take, keep the money. I mean, I'm, I don't want to get paid for something I didn't do uh -huh. anything, a, a good job on. So what do you want to do right now? I mean, if you could do anything and you say, boom, Matt, you can do anything. Right? Um, You'd be compensated for it. What would that be? Well, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in the mood to do anything now. Except <laughs> this coronavirus thing, I'm watching the news and going, oh, right, but you know. Sucking the life force out of everyone right now. Yeah, it? it's, just, it's, 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 a, it's, look, mm -hmm. I got my health right now. Woo so, so, um, you know. What some people are going through, I'm not going through. I'm not gonna. I'm not crabbing at all. But it's a fundamental, you know. I think there's a distraction here. I think, um, and I'm just, you know, I've been kind of pushing myself, like write something, anything. And sometimes I'll put it on Facebook, and and then I got this folder, and then I go back three days later and go, God, that was the stupidest thing I ever wrote. So I'm very, I'm known as a critic, but let me tell you the one thing I'm most critical about is me. I mean, I I get, I write something, and a month later, I just throw it in the trash. It's just terrible. So yeah. I've, er I've erased more of my writing than I've actually ever published. No, by far. Like, why did I do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm really harsh, really harsh. Uh, I don't know why, but, but I was like, I mean, I would have stayed a painter if I wasn't because, you know, I just made really bad paintings and then all so of a sudden. Would you ever go back to painting after everything you've been through? Any desire to? I've met, you know, I've met great painters. Uh, there, there's just, you, the, 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 the combination. I think anybody with a little art education, and I'm not talking about going to art school, you could, you could watch YouTube videos, uh, more than technique, even, even um, you know, you could watch an interview with John Baldessari and get what he was lecturing at CalArts in the mid 70s. So, so there's a lot of art theory out there you can get, you, you know, on whatever, YouTube or whatever. And you can read and study yourself if you really care about art. Um, so I, I think we're, we're at the point where just about anybody can make a well-made object or make a, a good painting. Right. But, um, and this is more than just taste. Like, oh, I have a taste for that type of art and that type of art. But there's still, it's like, yeah, when you, when you see a great artwork, even if you don't like it, you're like, yeah, fuck. <laughs> um, you kind of, you know. You're putting that conund that conundrum where your taste is is completely thrown out, and and but you can but you know the greatness, um, you know there there just there's just so many great so so my thing is like why would I you know I I, I never liked painting I like sometimes and I'm like this about writing too like oh God sometimes you're writing you're like oh God why 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 can't I just watch TV and be happy watching TV you know what I mean so so I I, I yeah, I, I'm not, I have no desire to paint. Uh, but I have, but, but let me tell you, sometimes writing is like, oh God, yeah. Ugh. You have to force it, but you, know, you do it, yeah. Hmm. But you do it. The better you get at writing, the more you hate it, because you just, you, you, you write, especially when you, the minute, and, and I'm spoiled, absolutely spoiled rotten in having an audience. So I can write and people will read it and I will get feedback. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of a disadvantage sometimes. I mean, it's a luxury that, you know, I don't know. Huh. When I was a starving, 
But then I look back on some of my old writing and I'm like, oh, cool. and then of course, when a coagula was really, you know, we, we would talk shit about people. And then you talk, oh God, what, oh, I hope that person never reads what I wrote, you know, things like that. So, you know. <laughs> okay, did you, have, you had to have fun doing it though, right? The coagula. Oh, why? Just I don't know that anybody ever had more fun in the art world than me. I really, absolutely, I was an absolute nobody. And, you know, I went from being an absolute nobody to Jasper Johns reading my art writing. I mean, I mean, and, I mean, I went from being a, an art school dropout to having um, Saul Lewitz subscribe to my magazine. I, you know, did, did, did David Bowie saying that, that he, he loved what I wrote, quoting my writing in an article about me. It's like, you know, um, so yeah, so that, you know, my, my, my saying is like, people in the art, they aspire to go to the top of the mountaintop. Right. I went around the back and got to the top of the mountaintop and then kind of walked down. And now it's like, yeah, you know, I, I had this great art world success and, 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 you know, I, at, at times made a lot of money. Um, yeah, but then sometimes like if there's a lot of bad art out there, it's like, do I just, what am I going to do? Start talking. You, you talk shit about art immediately. Everybody who's friends with that artist is all of a sudden, okay, now they're your enemy. Okay. So once you got something to lose in the art world, when it comes to relationships, you can't do some of the stuff I did. Yeah. So I have to, okay. So I can't really say sometimes like sometimes like, God, what if I could write, and it wouldn't be Matt Gleason if it would be somebody else. You know what I mean? And then I could really write what I want to write, but yeah, you don't want to, yeah. Somebody else has got to do it. And the problem is people do it on Twitter and it's just not, I mean, there, there's a way to take people down that just alters the way everybody looks at them, even their friends. Wow. And if you, do it, if you do it right. And there's also a way to do that building people up too. I mean, you know, huh. when you say the right thing and get people to notice, you know, and I'm far more interested in, in uh -huh. I used to be interested in tearing down the people up there, but I'm far more interested in like putting a light on interesting things. If, if, if I could write one essay that I knew everybody on the planet was going to read, mm -hmm. you know, I would want to write about an artist I liked and, or an art, or art, a, an art approach that I liked that like, look, when you look at this kind of art, you really are accelerating your consciousness or some shit, you know, but. So, right. I, I have to ask though, cause I know, you know, um, gallerists are so dependent on collectors and collectors are dependent on the stock market, or the, you know, the fun money. So when you have like someone like Eli Broad, who's like a billionaire and mm -hmm. he's able to buy art of the people he like, and all of a sudden that person is an instant celebrity because, you know, he just dropped, you know, one and a half million dollars on his painting. Mm -hmm. who's to say that artist is really a good artist you know what if well the the critique of eli broad um you, you I, name an artist that he actually broke open they say eli broad and and it's not just him it's a lot of these a lot of these people is they collect with their ears not their eyes and what that means is is basically they just hear they hear what's happening oh this is a good artist and then they go in and buy it and now uh -huh. Yeah, Eli Broad walked in and bought most of the Basquiat's when he had a show out here in L.A. in, in the early 80s. And those are the Basquiat's uh, that are now at the Broad Museum. But, you know, it was, Basquiat was already hot. Oh, hey, there's this hot guy from New York showing out here in L.A. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was already uh, happening, you know. So, so it's like, like say an artist who knows like a super wealthy person convinces that artist you know to sell a piece of artwork and then I'll like the banana guy um yeah but he was already that, that guy's Mauricio Catalan is you're talking about the guy who take the banana to the wall in the 2019 Miami Art Basel but he's been the biggest artist in Europe for the last 15 years I mean it wasn't like he came out of nowhere but he, he would have never had that um, that wall space to do that um all the other two know. bananas by the way or is it just that one what did he sell the other two bananas he had they said it was an addition of three, and I know they sold at least one, but um, the whole thing was that the the purchase is part of the artwork. So, yeah. But again, look, maybe the banana, I'm glad you brought that up. 
let's look at the banana as the peak. That was December of 2019. Right. Now we're in quarantine. It's April 1st, 2020. So that was December. Let's say that was December 1st. I think it was December 3rd, but okay, fine. December, January, February, March, April. Four months. Yeah. Doesn't it seem like it happened 10 years ago? It does. And, 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 and even that flippancy of it, that's a thing in the past. And that guy, Mauricio Catalan, he, you know, he's a prankster. He's from Italy. Yeah. So, so is, he, is, his, is his psyche going to be completely altered by this pandemic, especially how it affected Italy? Right. So, so, you know, oh, it's fun to be a goofball when Italy's in the EU and the economy's great and I'm making art that makes pokes fun at the institution and yet the institution collects it. And then the stock market crashed and everybody died and I'm not so fucking funny anymore. So, yeah, look at that banana as the peak. When are we going to get back to the banana? It's going to be a long time, I think. Yeah, if ever. Oh. And I'm an optimist. <laughs> Yeah, it will definitely be interesting. So are you going to be watching to see what happens next, these next few months? Well, what? you know, these next few months with artists, you know, because I know you know so many artists and people. Yeah. Talk. Part of me wishes, this is like a big picture answer, but mm -hmm. part of me wishes that there was like a law that a museum can't show anything under five years old. An auction house can't sell anything under 10 years old. One, that would, that would help with the galleries and the independent curators as far as having a place in the world. Um, but yeah, once a museum, when museums are showing new stuff, um, I think it just, it, it, it kind of alters. Uh, museums showing new art, which they always show from the big galleries, it's the equivalent of probably like in the movie industry, when there is the the child of a famous star is all of a sudden in movies and you're like they didn't go to the audition right you no know? well what about museums because of all this i mean they they're they were having they're suffering beforehand anyway before this, this virus. I don't, you know what institutions everything is a hustle all mm -hmm. right I got to get a job. I got to write an article so somebody will pay me so that I can put food on the table, right? And an artist has to make a painting so they can buy more art supplies, pay for the studio rent, and put food on the table. And so the institutions too, they have to suck up to that billionaire to get his money. And, you know, what is that billionaire he or she going to demand in return? So, uh, yeah, institutions are a big, it's just a big trade off. Um, but they're hurting you know what go cry to some billionaire there because you'll always be the institution you'll always be the museum you know, yeah. museum well, maybe you know maybe uh you know there's smaller museums these collectors are like i'm not going to give you any money so that your curators can have fun with it i'm gonna open my own museum so i can have fun with it <laughs> and um maybe maybe that'll be a thing of the past too what I always thought so great about galleries, it's kind of, in a way, a mini museum for people, you know, who've never really been to a museum before. I remember one time I, I took my, um, this young kid who was visiting to a bunch of different galleries that he had never been into before. You know, we weren't obviously going to buy anything, but he was just so immersed and impressed with all the artwork out there. Um, I thought it was much more valuable for him to see that than going to a museum um, yeah but but it's like um <laughs> it's like russian roulette yeah. how many times are you going to take somebody who's a novice of the art world to see an art show in a gallery that's a little too esoteric for them to pick up when they have no foundation in the arts you know there's that deep art dialogue that uh why I mean, do you have that to see art though i mean well well i mean there's a certain level of sophistication and so, for example, the average person, if you see a Jackson Pollock, not that you, you know, they're, they're too valuable, but let's say you took a, ja a real Jackson Pollock painting and you put it in, in a, um, uh, you know, a library has a small exhibition space, right? And you didn't say Jackson Pollock. And then across from it, you put um, 
some 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 Disney animation cells. People who don't know anything about art, they're, they're going to walk. Oh, that's that's a pretty splash painting. But wow, look, there's the Little Mermaid. There's Mick, Mickey and Minnie. You know what I mean? So I don't know that art should. Um, I'd be suspicious of art that just fundamentally appeals to the general public. I think that 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 art, it's like, hey, this is special. You know, when you go to, um, you know, when you go to, uh, it, if it doesn't mean anything to you, if you go to, if you go to the, um, like in Washington D.C., they've got the, they've got the um, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all that under glass. And then you go and you're like, oh, it's the Declaration of Independence. I'm an American. Then you look at the little thing. Yeah, this was reprinted in 1850. This isn't even the real fucking Declaration of Independence. I came all the way to Washington, D.C. You know what I mean? So, so, I, like, like, oh, the scholars, we have the Declaration of Independence, but it's, it's locked away in a vault somewhere. And the scholar can go look at it. It's like, eh. you know what I mean? Like, I'm not... I don't know that art needs to function as a tourism bureau. Does that make sense? Yeah, but doesn't it though? Does what? Act as a tourism bureau. I mean, you look at- No, 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 no. We, culturally that's been a, it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, if people walk in and they're like offended, yeah. upset, confused, sometimes that's fun, you know? <laughs> But at the same time, when art does that as like, uh, when it gets, you know, when it gets cocky, it need, we need people to, myself included, to kick it in the knees. Yeah. It's a little too cocky that way. Well, I like a little elitism, but I don't like a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I know I've been to a few art fairs where I've met a couple of gallerists who were very elitist um, and like a certain, uh, like a certain club that you had to, <clears throat> Be part of um <clears throat> a pose is a pose you i always look at the art they have like yeah. the art you have sh you know why do you have that attitude some galleries it's like it's it's uh, self-evident and if you know enough about art um you know the general public you know guy falling off the turnip truck isn't going to know the the greatness of an ed ruche versus uh you know just mm -hmm. some random some random painting and so, but when you go, well, you know what, in a hundred years, this is really going to reveal a reflection of the culture that it was made in much more articulately than any movie, if that technology will even survive, you know. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I remember meeting a couple, <laughs> that was my daughter, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, way over there. <laughs> Is she commenting about something else or is she listening to this? <laughs> oh, she's listening. <laughs> Her two cents. Um, I, I remember meeting a couple of art collectors and they told me they only buy artwork from art fairs and they have to be race specific art fairs. But yet every time they would come back from an art fair, they would never buy anything. So I, I always just think it's so funny that you know, there's always an excuse. There's a lot of collectors and they have, they have an art consultant. And the art consultant's job is to buy the art for them. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about a, a big art fair is it's vetted. And the big problem facing art that the art fairs solved, and again, if travel is affected, maybe mm -hmm. the art fairs won't, but the thing about art fairs is they're vetted. Mm -hmm. A collector of any level can have confidence that when they, when they show you this artwork, that artwork or that artwork, and they say, I got that at Art Basel, it's, it's pre-qualified. Now, it doesn't mean anything to, you know, Joe Schmo. And in 40 years, it might not mean anything to, to art history. Mm -hmm. You know, because remember, when the Impressionists were making their paintings, the top art was like these garish paintings of ostriches, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and stuff. So, so. So, but an, an art collector cannot be, or, or pardon me, a, a rich person who wants the right art for their house, they can't afford to be embarrassed. They can't, they, they can't afford to be conned. You know, how do I know that that's a good painting? 
you know, this, here, look, that's a painting by Gronk. You know, he's in a museum collection right away. Oh, okay. This is a print by Gronk. He's in a museum collection. Oh, right, right there, I have qualified him. So when somebody's selling you art, the first thing they try to tell you is why it's important, right? They don't sit there and say, oh, it's a beautiful red he used. They say, oh, he's an important artist. He was, he was part of an important group of, of artists that, that did this and did that. And, you know, and, and they give you art history. Art history, it just becomes a way to commodify art, you know? And change, yeah, uh, something to talk about. You know. Yeah, it's like, why, why, do, why do they want to buy that one? You know, oh, no, you know, forget about the gallery over there. My gallery has art that's important. So these fairs are, are, they're very heavily vetted to only show important art. Not that they do, but it's a qualifier. Oh. Because let's, let's say, for example, I'm an art consultant mm -hmm. and I work for a billionaire. And, uh, you know, somebody just says, hey, we'll buy this art and I'll kick back the money. Right? right? I'm fucking over the billionaire. Who cares if the billionaire gets fucked over? Well, at some point, is this a legitimate thing? Well, I'm an art, I'm an art consultant. I'm going to go, you can only buy art that was shown at these fairs. Then we know it was vetted. Then there's no suspicion on me, no suspicion on your collection. Because you can always say, well, I got this from such and such gallery at Freeze. You know? Right, on the top lines. Listen, okay, but then again, who picks the art from the art fairs? Is it one of those things where you just build a reputation over time? Or is it like one person who knows somebody else who decides to do it because they like some art? It's, it's, there's, you know, there's politics. And everything. There's all sorts of art world politics. And um, I mean, I was in a fair. I won't, I won't say what fair, but I got a call from the guy. I bought the booth. The fair, let's say the fair is in a month, okay? Mm-hmm. And a guy calls me and he says, hey, he goes, um, I got an offer for you. This is the guy who owns the fair. Mm -hmm. He goes, Matt, I got an offer for you. How about we cut your booth in half and you only pay me one third of what you were going to pay me. I'll save you money. It'll be easier to ship because you'll have a smaller space. And he goes, I'm, my, my fair's full and I really have to get this one, one person in it. I'm like, uh, oh, you know what? Okay, mm -hmm. let's do it. So it turns out that this half booth of mine, it wasn't the best booth because it was just, everything was scrunched, but you know, I saved a lot of money and I still saw the same collectors. I still made some sales and kept relationships going, kept the artists happy. Instead of taking three pieces by everyone, I took one, boom, boom, boom. You know, we had a good booth, yeah. but it was a small booth. So this other booth though, was uh, the, the person who had it was a new gallery. Nobody had ever heard of it. It hadn't even opened. It was going to open next month. But the person who owned the gallery was uh, basically an heir to a very big, you know, to a billion dollar fortune. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I've got a gallery. And so there, there came the parade of the fair organizers bringing the art media walk right past my half booth to this person's half booth because this person is a you know, connected rich kid. And there was a goddamn thing I could do about it. I couldn't scream and shout, hey, you gotta look, come to my booth because then this art guy, he'll tell everybody, I don't put him in the thing. He was screaming and moaning for art form to look at him. Art form's gonna think I'm a moron. They probably already think I'm a moron. But, but you know, it's just, there's, there's, um, there's a decorum there and, and politics. And the, the, when I did Coagula Art Journal, uh, or when I have my own space, it's like, hey, I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. I really do. But when you're curating a show, when you have a gallery that represents artists, you have to represent them. I had to like bite my fucking tongue many times, yeah. you know, and I couldn't just do what I wanted because I owe it to these artists to, to you know, do right by them. And, you know, and I believe I did that job. Here, watch this. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. My electrical outlet. You know, here, my electrical outlet or my beautiful... Gronk print. I love that Gronk print. That's really nice. I, and what's the piece below it? Oh, I I, I showed Phil and um, he had a solo show. Uh, it's the it's the Statue of Liberty uh, without any clothes on. And I showed him. He did a show at my place, and it was uh, 
um, the secret life or the afterlife of wood. So basically trees are alive and then uh, we cut them down and then they have this whole other life. They're not alive anymore, but they're still there and we interact with them. It's a brilliant, uh, brilliant show. And then behind me, that's a very old uh, uh, artwork by my wife, Lee Salgado. I love her work. That's Phil Bauer. That's uh, Val Echavarria. Huh. That's, you can't hear, I'm going to do this. What? That's a Juan Thorpe. Okay, cool. I haven't seen Juan in years. Juan's on, I see him on Facebook once in a great, great while. And this is this woman, Tatiana. This other one you can't see because my, my, um, my treadmill's in the way. Um, but commissioned her to do a, a, I commissioned that for as a gift to my wife and I wanted it to be about baseball. And so she, and, and, and our dogs. So she put our dogs in baseball uniforms. Ah, oh, cool. That's she has awesome. a long name, Tatiana um, Lubioski Costa or something. It's just this, okay. All right. Cool. Not everybody can be right. Jim Dine. <laughs> so, um, cool. How are you, Sophia? I I'm doing great. How are you handling the the quarantine? You know, I'm still working. I'm you gotta go to work, or do you work from home? Working from home. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Well, I go I go into the office once a week um, because they like wear a mask. Uh, a skeleton crew and you wear a mask. You have to wear a mask. <laughs> you wear a mask in the office? No, not in the office. I no? walked Is into the grocery store yesterday and I wore a mask. Those things are hard to wear. You got to wear them, though. You got to wear your mask. Face gets all sweaty. And you know what? Look, look, look. The West does not want to admit that Asia might know something that our brilliant people don't know. But, you know, there's Taiwan is right next to China, and they've only got like 150, 200 cases of this thing. Why? Because they all wear masks. Yeah. Put a scarf on even. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, no, you could, I mean, there's a hundred different ways to do a man. You know, here, look, yeah, you can hear. This is, this is my thing to clean my glasses. Oh, here comes somebody. Oh, hi. Yeah, so. I see the hair. <laughs> I have enough hair. Yeah, my, after this quarantine long, lasts long enough, yeah, you could use your hair. I'm, I'm going to be doing that with my hair. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're doing good. I'm glad to hear that. You know, I'm still writing like crazy, and um, you know, I did a Zoom read of a pilot I wrote because I have a couple producers involved, and hey, it was great. Zoom was awesome. You know? Wow! And that's what inspired me to, you know, say, like, hey, let me talk to some some people I know and zoom in on some stuff people wouldn't know otherwise. And you now I'm always, you know, my heart's always in the art world. You know, even though I may not yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> Look, the, the problem with the art world, as far as um, we all, you know, you, you put into the art world and you get something back and the, the art world doesn't give back. Okay. okay. When you're a, you're a, you're a, as a thespian, like you write a play and you do the one act and some people come see it. Okay. So you know what I mean? You're, you TV, movies, there's, the, but man, art. Ooh, yeah. You're alone in the studio and then what? Yeah. You got a show at a gallery and what's the foot traffic to the gallery and then it's over and ugh, you know but i think art's about the long game it's to me it's time travel it's 100 years from now right you know, that's that's the only art i've ever been interested in well but you, you bring together such a great community of people though you know all these different talents and you know my well you know you go where you're loved yeah. that's the one thing i've learned you go where you're loved and so, um, yeah, you go where you're loved. So, you know, if, if people feel good around me, we're going to have a good time. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I always try to do right about the artists. So what do you think about these movies that have, like, art in it? Like, um, was it Velvet Buzzsaw? Did I say it right? Buzzsaw. You know, the movie with um, Jake Gyllenhaal? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story. In the movie Pecker, John, John Waters made a movie about the art world, Pecker. And in the movie, he mentions Coagula, my magazine. There's a scene where they say, watch out for that guy. <laughs> He's from Coagula. It's a magazine. That's, that's the line. John was a big, he was a subscriber, big supporter of Coagula for years. He was, he was a fun guy. Um, I did an interview with him over the phone years later. 
but I'd seen him in, the, in a crosswalk in New York and said, hey, John, I want to get in your art movie. So anyway, uh, you know, if you've been in the art world long enough, you're going to have times where you're up, where you're down, up and down. So I was up at one time. Woo, man, I was like an art star almost. And this big time guy had published, uh, Tom Patchett uh, had published my book, Most Art Sucks. And I said, you know, maybe there's a screenplay in this about starting this magazine and, and taking on the art world. And Tom Patchett was like, hey, maybe. I know plenty of people. And then a pecker came out. I'm like, hey, pecker came out. They mentioned, they mentioned Coagula. And then um, Tom Patchett, uh, I, go to the, I go to a meeting at Tom's and he says, well, did you see Siskel and Ebert? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they didn't like, they didn't like Pecker. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, Siskel looked right into the camera and he said, and John Waters, the art world, please talk about tired material. Gene Siskel said that to the camera. And I went, I went, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah I saw that. And he goes, he goes, he goes, and Tom, Tom told me, he goes, yeah, what he was saying is, Matt, you're never going to get your movie made. <laughs> So, so now, you know what I mean? Like, like it, shit comes and goes, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so maybe in 20 years, uh, there will be some artist story and I interacted with them and they'll have me write the damn screenplay. Who knows? And maybe not, maybe there'll be nothing, but like Velvet Buzzsaw, it's obvious to me that somebody had a really good art world movie. And the, the, the one way you can get a movie made, because it will have a, a guaranteed audience and therefore a guaranteed amount of money back as a horror movie. So right. somebody said, oh, make it a horror movie and then, and then we'll talk about it. So they added all, you know, to me, it was like this art, it had too much great art world satire, but right. nobody cares. The general public doesn't care about that. Yeah. They don't, they don't care. They, do. and they I don't want them to care. Who cares? <laughs> what kind of nerd would you have to be? Like, like I don't want to watch... Um, What's that movie, Houston, we have a problem with when the, 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 oh. they're out floating in space and they might die? It was a couple of years ago. I, don't, I, I, I want to watch that as a movie. I don't want to learn science on how to send a man to the moon. So I don't, you don't want to go see a movie to learn how to like the art world works. You know, it's, it's a boring fucking subject to <laughs> most people. I find it endlessly fascinating. Right. Well, it's a small circle of people who are like really into it, you know. Well, yeah, and, and, and what percentage, though, are interested out of, out of self-interest because they're artists, so it's not never really about the art world, it's about them. It's about me. You know? <laughs> but so. In every profession, it's always like that, isn't it? You know, it's like with lawyers or with actors or with writers, it's like... It's never no, but, but, there's, but in the art world, there's, there's, there's no venues. And like, for example, uh, the, what's the famous line from Hollywood? But what I really want to do is direct. Okay, so, but they're a PA or they were an actress or a screenwriter, but what they really want to do is direct. So the art world, there's no venues. I mean, you know, yeah. The difference between the top and the bottom in the film industry is huge. In, in, in art, it's like, eh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I've been on the top and I've been on the bottom and it's a very cyclical thing. I mean, in, in that regard, it's very similar to, to Hollyweird. Hollyweird is right. I mean, yeah. You could, you could you could be so hot and everybody kissing your ass and oh how great you are and everything you do is great and you know a week later you know. all right so would you say that there is a dark side to the art world yeah. oh yeah yeah i mean there's there's just selfish pricks everywhere <laughs> i mean it always comes down to ego and selfishness and there's yeah there's a lot of people i remember this one guy i won't say who it was i mean it almost doesn't matter yeah. but this guy i was at an art opening and we were walking to our car and this whole way, and he was an artist and he wanted me to write an article about him or who knows what, curate him into a show. And he's sitting there telling me how great I am and I'm one of the greats and man, God, you, you know, you're maverick and oh man, oh, my head swells. And we get to this parking lot and they've towed four cars and they're towing the fifth car. Our car's long gone. Oh, wow. And I'm like, oh, fuck, they towed my car. What are we going to do? And this guy's like, see you later. Boom. And, and I always thought, wow. That, that, and I, you know what? That was early. That was really early when shit was just starting to happen for me. But it, I always remember that. Like, wow. A minute ago, I was the greatest motherfucker in the world, especially when there was a chance I could do something for you. But the minute, yeah. you might have to stop and do something for me it was good. without a guaranteed payoff. Wow. unexpectedly right. at nine o'clock at night 
you oh man wow he was good so, so I, oh that one that mm -hmm. and then i was able better but but you know and people kiss your ass and you actually do stuff for them and then nothing ever happened there's no reciprocity and you're kind of like eh, oh well yeah and then sometimes you're like wow why did i give my time to that person i got nothing out of it why did i dare go you know so there is something to be said about like you know what if you're not there's a People in the art world, like, like y you do stuff for free. And then after a while, you're just like, oh, if I do stuff for free, I'm going to get used. But and so I'm not going to do anything for free anymore. You can tell now. You, I mean, you can tell if someone's, like, using you. And well, I mean, you know, put, I always just say, I was like, where's the money coming from? First, and, and I used to, when I, people used to go, well, where's the money coming from? And I'm like, oh, that person has no real belief in art. <laughs> But they do, but they, they know, you know, it's like, hey, I'm not going to spend a month of my life doing right. anything for you if there's no money. you going to pay me? Oh, you're going to pay me? Great. What do you want to do? You want to open a gallery? I'll tell you how to open a gallery. You want to meet people in the art world? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, but hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, come on, man. That's, that's, that's you know. low, right? Yeah. Remember the 70s, that sticker on every van? No, I don't remember the 70s. <laughs> okay hey sophia you remember the 2000s <laughs> there you go that's what i like it <laughs> remember was it was it was it gas grass or ass nobody rides for free <laughs> you don't remember that you don't remember that it was a sticker it was like you know it was like that's hey. not very 70s right huh that's that's very seventies. Gas, grass, or ass. Nobody rides for free. So I got to be, you know. But but um, you know, I, I still like to think that the I don't I, I don't see the art world. People come in there with this naive idea that it's this community, it's not or that. they come in with this manipulative idea that by implying that this is a community, they can get a lot out of it without ever giving to it. Yeah. So those are the two sides: the naive side and the manipulator side. That you just you gotta you don't flip. <laughs> you don't want to flip that coin. You wanna you want to spend that coin. And so that's, that's what I've learned. What is she? What does that matter? She's making all these noises. Do you want to, okay, well, you're making, you're making your presence known. So do you want to come say hi real quick? Okay, she said sorry. Now she's whispering. I'm, put, I mean, I'm even putting on my hat for her. Right. Now I brought my hat for Olivia. Now she's all embarrassed. <laughs> I'm wearing my hat for Olivia. Call she called me Indiana Jones when I, last time she saw me with this hat on. So Yeah, come say hi real quick. All right, now she's being super shy. Oh, <laughs> good on you. The hat looks good on you. She, she's hey. happy because she doesn't have to work right now. That's how you shut them up. <laughs> All right, you have a chance to say hi. Are you going to do it or not? Yes. Yes? All right. All right, come say hi. Hi. Hey, Olivia, how you doing? Pretty awesome. Good to hear. Good to hear. All right. Does your mom talk this much when she's not on camera? Yes. Well, see, I'm not going to work. I threw you under the bus like that. No. <laughs> it's so nice to talk. Yeah. All right, yeah, well. which has my TV on silent. Yeah, she put, her TV, she put her TV on silent so I can talk to you and record this. That's how much she loves me. Olivia, thank you. Because I don't know if your mom's thanking you, but I'll thank you. <laughs> All right. So, no, let me talk to you about it for a little bit longer. What? I'm watching she, something amazing and I can't even put the volume up. Okay, well, see, she's smacking me. This is parental. <laughs> you owe me $3 uh, for this. I owe her money for this now. Okay, all right. Oh, I'm not you. even getting paid for my appearance on this show, and you're getting paid? What? Oh, she's... <laughs> she has a better agent than me, apparently. <laughs> I'm almost close to being 22, so I know how to make puns. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, see. Say goodnight. Good night, Jeff. That's not Jeff. That's Matt. Matt, sorry. <laughs> I gotta be around, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see you later. Good night, Olivia. All right. Good night. Night. Yeah. Um, she um, she made me a necklace today, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yep. You moved your camera. Now there's a naked woman behind you. There is. Yeah. Oh, that artwork. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Mary Clark Camargo. Mary Clark Camargo made that. It's one of the first art pieces I purchased. That's your story. You better stick to it. Years ago. 
see, it reminded me of like um, the goddess of the empress in the tarot cards, you know, the pregnant, you know, creativity. I remember, you know, it was like all about keeping that creativity flowing, you know, being in the flow, giving birth to ideas. I know that's a feminine thing, right? <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the problem is that um, that's the one time where, um, you know, people have critiques of, uh, of the art world being um, overly representative of men and, and, and white males. And that's whenever women talk about subjects in art that, that are, that have, a, that have a feminine foundation, uh, oh, all bets are off for any equity, for any care. The, the man can be macho and heroic and make this great statement, but oh, that woman cannot, you know, she can give life, but she can't make art about it. No. So yeah, yeah. That, that's a like phallus than a vagina, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's the one the one thing I've seen where where all of that stuff is completely laid bare. And people they fall into that trap every time, no matter who. A lot of women do too. A lot of women don't want to talk about uh mm -hmm. those issues in the art. They wanna they want it to be on that masculine playing field. Uh, let me show you one of my favorite pieces. Oh, I got, geez. Sorry, now we're we're moving. Uh -huh. Uh, Are you doing this on a phone? I'm doing mine on a laptop. Yeah, or not, I mean, a desktop even. Uh, hold on one second. You're on a phone? Uh, no, I'm on. I, it's dark now. Um, okay. It's dark. I want to show you one of my favorite, favorite pieces, but it's really dark now. It's dark. It's dark. It's dark. I'm just like, looking for a good place to put this. And I know this is like so. Ta da! That's one of my favorite pieces. Wait, zoom in. I can't. Oh! My wife, that my wife's artwork, yes. Yeah, yeah, I love that piece. Yes. I love that piece. It's like one of my all-time favorites. And it's so, it's, it's feminine but strong. There's strength and sexuality and sensuality and, and everything that scares white men. It scares all men. Yeah. It scares everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's the goddess and there's everybody else. You it's so cool about this virus, about forcing everyone to stay home. Yes, there is an upside to it. What it's is that? Forcing everyone to like slow down, you know, and just like really kind of like really see things and contemplate, meditate. But what, one of the things I hate is when people say I'm busy because, you know, they'll say things like, I'll say, uh, oh, did you see that thing on Facebook? And they'll say, I'm too busy. The implication, which they don't get, because they're talking about, oh, I get the rewards for being busy. They're implying that I am not busy. That I no, 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 am no. lazy or have this luxury life that I can look at Facebook instead of being busy. No, no. They're saying busy means they don't care to really see it. No, no. You know what? You don't have time. You make time. And I believe that people, um, I believe that people, they have all the time in the world when it's important. You know, to them, when it's, when it's something important to them, yeah. So it's you know, well, yeah, so right now. I mean, for a few months now, they've been saying this is the time of the divine feminine. You know, you, I'm sure you've heard that, right? Huh? You have what? Okay. <laughs> okay, Venus is in Taurus tonight. I heard that. You heard that? Venus is in Taurus, yeah, for like two more nights, I think, yeah. Right, okay, all right. So that's that's part of the divine feminine, too, you know, right? You look, <laughs> I love you, Matt. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that now is now is a time where there's a lot more balance, and with this quarantine, you know, it's giving people a chance to really slow down and see things more internally, which is more of a feminine aspect than a masculine aspect. You know, so. I think so. You know, so it's like, I think once this is over, no matter how long it takes. You're calling women lazy. Where did that come from? <laughs> We're slowing down, taking it easy. Men are out there busy doing things. Women are just eating bonbons at home. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. Oh, you yeah. said that. I wish I was eating bonbons at home. <laughs> Olivia, go get some bonbons. Um. You know, it's like, you know, staying at home and working from home is a lot more work than actually going to the office and working. It really? Is, yeah, it is. But a lot less traffic. Oh, God. The times I have gone to work, there's been, like, no traffic, so it takes me, like, 20 minutes. 
which yeah. is so much better than our our time. Yeah, I went. I had to go to my doctor. Um, I had a complete panic attack that I had the COVID, and so I drove from. I live south of downtown LA. Yeah. And I drove to Westwood to UCLA Medical Center in 28 minutes. Wow. At like a peak traffic time. And, you and it was like, couldn't test. believe it. You took a COVID test or? No, I did not take a COVID They were like, you don't have to get out of here, you moron. Do you, so Do you have a fever? No. Do you have a cough? Yeah. Are you coughing all the time? No, I, I coughed up a little phlegm. Okay. So the, so the, so the, the, um, the paperwork says, uh, reason for visit, cough. Analysis, cough. <laughs> No COVID, nothing. I didn't have a COVID. It was it was a month ago when we didn't know all we know now. Right. Okay. Now they say just take a smell test. If you can smell, then you, you don't have COVID. Okay. Smell and taste. If you can smell and taste, you don't have COVID. All right. Well, that's good. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's also flu season. It's allergy season. And panic season. <laughs> Every season is panic season. Come on. Have some fun here. Stocks are crashing. People are freaking out. It's like, just, just condemn me to COVID. <laughs> it's like, no, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. So, yeah, it's all going to well, be that. Was this everything? Or do you, do, are we supposed to, or is there something else we have to cover? There's always going to be something, which is oh. awesome about you. Because oh, okay. Right? So take that as a compliment, man. I try the monocle here. All right. Uh, yeah, that works. Okay. All right, I know what we've been, you know, it's so nice to talk to another adult. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have the uh, advantage of living with my wife, an adult. She has the advantage of talking to a child when she talks to me. So, yeah, I see clearly now. Um, cool. This was fun. Awesomeness. All right, cool. Well, no, I, I'm sure things will be back to, you know, somewhat normal soon. No. We can dream, can't we? Well, yeah, it is because I'm I'll tell you like, what ain't normal is this fuck, all this fucking hair, man. I gotta get a haircut, and that's that ain't gonna happen in the next couple of months. You have really long hair. I don't like this at all, but here I have it. The buzz, you know, just buzz it. If you decide to buzz it, you know, videotape it, make it live performance. Art. I was told by my wife there will be no buzzing of the hair. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Well, so. you have a lot of hair. You're lucky. No, a lot of yeah, yeah, you're right. Fifty-five. Look at this. Look at this shit. I love it. That's great. That's good. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like the gray underneath it. It looks good. The one, the one attribute. You know, you have the list of attributes, and for me, it's like a uh, good head of hair. <laughs> Works. Yeah. After that, <laughs> so. a long beard too. Now, because I gotta wear, because if I'm gonna ever be going back into public, I gotta, I gotta, I definitely gotta sh shave, and I start looking like, you know, look. Right. Let me tell you about my gold mine. I got, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't. I gotta, I gotta have my right. well, hipster this is glasses over, here. We're going out for margaritas. That's all there is to it. What? When this is all over, we're going out for margaritas. Right? Drink up. I'm driving. You know, definitely. <laughs> all right, man. You're awesome. I appreciate your time. And that was fun. Thanks. Now, when I get my next new film going, I'll, I'll put you in it. Uh, I'll write a, a role just for you. Great. I, 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 uh, you turn on the camera and I'll ham it up. <laughs> just be you, right? <laughs> you're, you're That's, like I said, the only thing I've, on my IMDb page, the only thing I've done is himself. So. Oh, okay. That's the only character I play. You know, when you're on, on set with RuPaul, so you, you know, when you're all stiff upper lip, that was pretty awesome. You know, I, Olivia loves that show, Fresh Paint. I've seen it. Get, you know, people, because of Netflix, people see it, and I, I get the occasional missive. Um, the cool one was the guy who did my voiceover in Brazil said, I hope I did you justice. Awesome. With, with, that you sound intelligent in Portuguese. <laughs> there I am going... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, da, 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 da. you know, it's like, okay, well, yeah, he, he did a great job. <laughs> so, well, they, they should do a sequel for that. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm, like I said, you turn on the camera, I'm ready to go. All right, cool. I will definitely keep you posted. Very cool. You're awesome. Good night. All right, have a good night. Mwah. Good night. All right. Ciao, bye. Do do How do I stop this? Stop. Leave meeting. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, wait. Do you want to leave?